Uh, you got a you got a program in front of you with a schedule that can be very hard to keep on track because there's so many variables. And I want to thank the guy standing at the podium, Mr. Tim Krogan, because he's done a great job keeping us on schedule. So thank you, Tim. And unless Dr. Fink changes our mind, I think our plan is we've got a few questions we did not get asked in the time frame yesterday. So I'm going to ask those questions and, and give Dr. Fink an opportunity to respond to those. When we run out of questions here, Dr. Fink can either just tell us what he wants to tell us or we can pass a microphone and try to get more questions. So Dr. Fink, yes, sir. are you ready, sir? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. oh, okay. So, oh, there you are. <laughs> I was looking for you. Okay, so you, you can ask me a few questions from yesterday. Okay. SPG7, an autosomal recessive examples uh, that S, uh, SPG7 gene mutated to dominant comment. That's what's written, and I'm, so you can interpret what that question is. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to be here, and I hope I didn't keep everybody waiting. Um, I will answer any questions. Nothing's off the table. I have to say that uh, when we get specific questions and I give spe specific answers, this is a general question, but specific questions and specific answers, I can't give medical advice in this forum. I mean, doctor to patient recommendations. I can give, everything is going to be couched with that proviso that this is a general comment and, and we have to talk with your doctor or I could talk with your doctor, but anyway, so I can give, it may sound specific and I may get uh, kind of dogmatic, well I recommend this, but it's still not medical advice in this form. That's a, that's a small print. Okay, now the question is SPG7. And uh, one thing I would say, I didn't answer the question yet. One thing I would say, I, I'm going to try to answer the question and also make it somewhat general use for everybody. So SPG7 uh, is um, one of the most common forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia. It's a recessive form. Now, this question asked about recessive forms. Um, the disorder, it was uh, one of the first, maybe actually the second HSP gene ever discovered. Um, so uh, it, it's been known for many, many years. When it was originally identified uh, by Dr. Balabio in uh, Italy, it was identified as a recessive disorder. And that means that each parent is a carrier, and each parent is unaffected, and the, the children of carriers are at risk of inheriting the gene mutation, one mutation from one parent, one mutation from the other parent, and if that happens, then the, the child will be affected. The child, the child won't have a normal gene copy. Each carrier parent has a normal gene copy, but the child will have two abnormal co gene copies and will be affected. That's what we mean by recessive. Okay. And about 20 years after um, the discovery of this gene, because this was discovered in the early 90s. Oh, no, 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 in late 90s. So maybe 15 years after the discovery of this gene. Uh, somebody described an individual, reported in literature, they had the symptoms of hereditary spastic paraplegia, but they only had one mutation in the SPG7 gene. And uh, so everybody said, okay, that's interesting, but maybe there's another mutation in that person we just didn't identify. You know, the, the gene testing found one, but we think there's what we call a cryptic mutation or another mutation that wasn't identified. And they said, well, we looked as much as we could. We only found one mutation. Okay. And then it was described in another person that a person with one mutation in the SPG7 gene had symptoms 
and they transmitted those symptoms and that one mutation to their child. And so that looks like a dominant form of inheritance. Dominant inheritance, one mutation in one parent is transmitted to a child, a single mutation, not mutations on both copies of the gene. And so we accepted, and there have been numerous reports of that since. And, uh, and uh, I've seen, I, I, for a while I was counting. When I got up to 20 individuals that had single copy SPG7, I stopped counting. I mean, I see it not infrequently. But it's not the majority. So the point is this. Is SPG7 still a recessive disorder? Yes, it is. Can it be transmitted in a dominant manner with a single copy mutation? Yes, but very infrequently. Now, how infrequently? I can't tell you. I'm not, I can't say if it's 10% or 20% or something like that. It's much less common than having two copies of the mutation. That's what it appears today. And this gets very complicated. If that's not complicated enough, this is more complicated. What do you tell somebody when they have SPG7 and they're uh, recessive, they have two copies, and they say, well, what's the chance that I could pass this on to my child? And this is very difficult to say because 20 years ago, we'd say recessive disorders are not transmitted from parent to child. And, but what do we say now that we know that some SPG7 mutations could be dominant? We say um, it's still quite unlikely that the disorder would be transmitted from parent to child. So we would say if a person is, this, this is, this is, we're learning as we go, and this is the empiric, and empiric risk to date, that is, when the, uh, this is what I usually follow, when the, when the proband, when the main person who comes in for consultation is, has the disorder as a recessive condition, we expect, or we would predict, that the disorder would be transmitted in a recessive manner, which means that parents wouldn't transmit it to children. However, if the person coming into the office has a single copy mutation and they may, may, it may behave as a dominant disorder, we always have to say, well, maybe the condition could be transmitted in a dominant disorder. So the counseling, and this is a really long explanation, but the counseling depends we're basing it on what the presenting person has. If they present with two mutations in a recessive manner, we predict that the disorder for them is probably a recessive condition. And if they present with one mutation, um, and we, th we think it could be a dominant disorder, then we think in that person it might be uh, 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 transmitted to, it could be transmitted to children. So that's all I can tell you. This is a this is a comment, but one you could re respond to perhaps. This person says, make sure your doctor uses the Medtronic baclofen. Avoid the use of a, quote, compounding pharmacy. Any thoughts on that comment? Medtronic baclofen. That's what this says. Uh, I'm not, we may have to, whoever asked this, we may have to discuss this separately. But Medtronic refers to the pump. It, uh, that the baclofen is given through, and uh, and so a specific that 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 specific it's baclofen is the chemical, leorosol is the is the name of that chemical, and baclofen is what is the uh, um, uh, trade name. So the the business about Medtronic that's the name of the pump, and there's always a special pharmacist, a compounding pharmacist who has to prepare. The, or I, I guess it comes in a, in a form of a pump, in the, in the liquid form for uh, administration. But the, uh, the, there's only one form of baclofen. It can be given from the manufacturer in the form used for the pump, or it can be given from the manufacturer in the form used for oral administration. And I'm not, that's all I can tell you. Are there implantable devices for urinary and or fecal incontinence? Uh, yes, actually, there are. Um, this is a difficult issue. Uh, I mean, it's a complicated question, and because there are so many uh, factors that could cause urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence, um, 
and and so uh, the the uh, implanted devices are most effective when there's urgency, and that urgency, um, but but they're not effective. For example, if there's pelvic floor muscle laxity or weakness, if there's incontinence, like what we call stress incontinence, when you cough or sneeze or bend over and you leak urine, that's a, typically a pelvic floor muscle weakness. And there's not a, in, I'm not aware, I'm not a, a urologist, I'm not aware of any implantable device to, to uh, um, ameliorate pelvic floor muscle weakness. But when there's incontinence because the bladder is so um, uh, hyperactive that when it fills up with a small amount of urine, it needs to expel it quickly, that there are, there are implantable devices that can relax the bladder, that can stimulate the bladder in a way to cause it to relax. Um, and it's not, that would be not the first option. First, there'd be medication. Then, the, well, first there'd be behavioral um, maneuvers such as um, frequent toileting. Every two hours, or every, every two hours, go sit on the toilet, whether you need it or not. Um, and just keep, just frequent toileting. That's a behavioral maneuver. Then there's medications. We talked yesterday about Ditropan or, or Mirbetric to try to relax the bladder, and there are other medications that can try to relax the bladder so that the bladder can fill more completely. Beyond that, there's, and these are approaches to relax the bladder. Then there are um, uh, Botox injections and uh, into the bladder muscle to try to weaken the bladder muscle so that it can expand more fully and then not, um, not uh, contract so frequently at small volumes of urine. That's Botox, we're moving up the scale. Then there's uh, something called uh, posterior tibial nerve stimulation. This is where the uh, posterior tibial nerve is, there's a stimulator placed um, on the leg. And that, those signals go up to the same place that uh, affects the bladder. And so this is, this is an implantable um, stimulator. Um, it's not in the bladder, but it, it's an implantable device that, that uh, affects the, the bladder uh, and um, causes it to relax. Beyond that, there are other implantable devices that can be explored, but we're moving up the chain in, com in, in complexity and, and, and uh, you know, intervention, and so uh, we, would, we would do one and then another and, and so forth and so on. Now, everything I said about the bladder about for, uh, there's, we would also use similar approaches for uh, fecal incontinence. And we have to look, each of these is, each of these is, uh, could have many different causes. So, um, fecal incontinence could be because of, of uh, urgent, fecal urgency, that there's need to propel the stool in the, in the colon. That's one. But fecal incontinence could be multifactorial, it could be related to the content of the diet, there's excessively loose stools, the overall GI motility, is it affected by medication, so forth and so on, pelvic floor laxity. So there's many factors that can contribute to um, fecal incontinence, just like urinary incontinence. And the, 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 my side of the street on this is, is it due to muscle hyperactivity? Um, from, uh, from the underlying conditions, HSP and PLS. Do you have any recommend, recommendations regarding dietary therapy or particular kinds of diets that might positively, positively help either of these conditions? Uh, uh, so, no. Um, except to say a well-balanced diet um, mainly plant-based. This is not for HSP or PLS, this is just general health. And, uh, but rich in vitamins, but avoiding, I can't make a recommendation, and I'm not making a recommendation for mega vitamin supplements of any kind. 
uh, and I know some people do. And, uh, but the, the reason is, is because I'm not, and I'm not disparaging um, uh, practitioners who make those recommendations, but I cannot make a recommendation for a, um, a mega vitamin supplement of any kind because it's not based on, the, on my knowledge base. And I do this on a peer-reviewed literature. Does it help HSP? Does it help PLS? Does it help a neurologic condition? If I can't find an evidence for it in that literature, um, uh, I'm, uh, then I can't make a, a, a scientific recommendation for it. Now, I, I'm straying from this, uh, that, this uh, rigor a little bit by saying, it's not a bad idea to take uh, vitamin E, and it's not a bad idea to take coenzyme Q10. Now, when I say vitamin E, I mean a normal amount of vitamin E, because, uh, and that's, I think, 400, uh, and this sounds like a medical recommendation, or a prescription, this is a general concept. Uh, I think it's 400 uh, units a day. And because excessive vitamin E is toxic and can cause neuropathy. So if I say, well, Dr. Fink says a vitamin E is a good idea, let me take a lot of that to try to get over this thing. No, I'm, I'm absolutely not recommending mega doses of vitamin E, but, but these are, it, it, it does function as an antioxidant. And uh, coenzyme Q10 has been shown to have some benefit in degenerative neurologic processes. So um, uh, I was once uh, suggested by a, a thought leader in neurology, why doesn't everybody take uh, coenzyme Q10 every day? So I'm not, I'm not saying these are necessary, but uh, uh, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to add a vitamin E and a, and a coenzyme Q10 to your diet. But Beyond that, I have no recommendation. And uh, this, this is a very common uh, question, and we just don't know. Now, having said all this, and I'm going to go on to the next question in a second, I promise, is that some people find that certain nutritional supplements help them. I've heard this from some people. They say, well, I, I added this... Uh, supplement to my diet and it really made a difference. My joints feel better and this and that. But, but I can't, make, I can't uh, generalize from this. But if a person finds that something's helping them, then I would encourage them to keep doing it. How do we find out about clinical studies or trials? This person says in the southeast, but anywhere in the country. How do we learn about that so we can participate and well, support them? So if there's a trial involving HSP and PLS, I'm sure it will be published on the SPF website. That's one. But besides that, uh, there's a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials, all one word, dot gov. And that is, a, is an NIH-based website, National Institutes of Health website, and uh, it lists all registered clinical trials. And if, a, if, a, uh, if, a, an, uh, an if a university is, going to con is using federal funds to conduct a clinical trial, they must be published on that website. Now, if, uh, if a, uh, other organizations that are not federally connected are doing their own research, they may be under that radar. But... Um, any, and they publish all kinds of trials. So you could go there and say clinicaltrials.gov and they say, what are you interested in studying? You could say hereditary spastic paraplegia or primary lateral sclerosis. Type in the search, in the search uh, bar what you're interested in and they'll show you studies uh, potentially around the, around the world. And uh, they'll say some studies are recruiting subjects, some studies are finished, some studies are in the planning stage, um, and, uh, and they'll list where they're located and the contact information for people there. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's a really good clearinghouse for finding information. Are AFOs beneficial for patients that drag their toes? What kind uh, of AFOs are best? 
Well, so an ankle foot orthotic, AFO, this is to keep the toes up because um, many people, many people, um, well, I, if I walk over here, you can't hear me. You can see me, but you can't hear me. So many people drag their toes and trip over their toes. And that's because was the, the foot strike, normally when you're walking, well, I'm going over this way. Normally when you're walking, well, you can't see my feet anyways. But normally when you're walking, what's that? Oh, I could do that. Okay, good idea. So, so uh, I was going to demonstrate those dance steps we talked about yesterday. <laughs> Not. So normally when you're walking, we don't land on our heels. We do not land on our heels. We call it a heel strike, but it's not a heel strike. It's, we don't, people don't walk on their heels. Even though we call it a heel strike, you're landing on the back part of your foot, towards the heel. So when you're walking, the first part of your foot that hits the ground is the back part of your foot. And then, then you hit the ground with the back part of your foot. As you transfer weight forward, you roll to the outside of your foot. So now the weight is shifting from the back part of the foot to the outside, more in the middle of the foot. And then you shift forward to the inside and roll off your big toe. So you land on the outside, you roll on the out, you land on the back, you roll towards the outside, you then roll towards the inside and you push off your big toe. Okay, when there's spasticity, or when there's an upper motor neuron problem, the foot strike gets shifted forward. So instead of landing on the, outside, landing on the back of the foot, people land either in the middle of the foot or they land in more, more when it's more advanced, they land on the toes. Toe walking is a maximally forward shifted foot strike. Okay, so that's toe walking is because the upper motor neuron process for a number of reasons causes the foot strike to be shifted forward and when it's in its extreme form, it, you're, you're landing on your toes. Okay, so if you imagine this, the two, uh, two sides of the coin, when, you're, when, you're, um, when you land on your, the back of your foot, your toes are up. When you, and so as the, you land more forward on your foot, your toes are increasingly not up. So if you land in the middle of your foot, if, you land in, if I land in the middle of my foot, my toes are towards the ground. If I land on my heel, my toes are way up. If I land in the middle of my foot, my toes are less up. And obviously, if I land all the way forward, my toes are completely on the, on the ground. So the, there's a, the farther forward my foot strike is, the less my toes are up. These are two sides of the same coin. Um, so we call that the foot, the toes coming up, we call that dorsiflexion. The foot is bending back, dorsiflexing. And um, the, uh, so, and, People, this is very common. In fact, I would say everybody. I would say everybody. Uh, except if, not you can't say everybody because there could be a, other conditions that might, uh, might make this not true. But almost everybody has this forward shifted foot strike of various degrees and various degrees of the toes not coming up. This is almost everybody with an upper motor neuron problem. The only reason I don't say everybody is because if a person had an upper motor neuron problem and another condition like a peripheral nerve problem, they could have, they could have other, other situation affecting that. Or, but anyway, I don't get into it. So an AFO. An AFO is designed, it's a, it's a, it's a, a form of a brace. It goes under the foot and typically behind the calf to keep the toes up. And, uh, and so it, it doesn't let the toes drop and you don't stumble over your toes. 
and it doesn't fix any problem. It doesn't fix the spasticity or the forward shifted foot strike. It doesn't do anything. It just prevents the toes from dropping on the floor so you, a person is not stumbling over their toes. Now, uh, there are a wide variety of AFOs. Some have hinges, some are not rigid, some uh, are basically uh, a strap that goes around the, the ankle and then a, 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 a tie goes into the shoelace that just um, keeps the toes up in that manner. So there's a whole variety of AFOs. I can't tell you which one would work best for which person. That's all on the individual. They're often custom made so that they fit around the calf. One size doesn't fit all. Now, business about AFOs is this. Um, they, nobody likes an AFO. I mean, especially not at the beginning. Um, but because they might be uncomfortable and they're changing the way that a person walks, they're, they're, uh, it's an appliance. But, but some people will say they're com I've, they've become comfortable, so the, they may take two or three weeks to get used to. But people then say, uh, actually, I can walk faster with an AFO. And, I, and I'm, I'm more secure in my walking with an AFO because I'm not stumbling. Okay, so that's a good outcome. There's a, um, another situation in which uh, the, there's so much tightness that the feet are being pushed down because of spasticity in the ankles that there's a, there's a war going on between the spasticity pushing the toes down and the AFO trying to keep the toes up. And that, and trust me, the spasticity is gonna win and they'll be very uncomfortable and they'll be in the closet, uh, which is often the most comfortable place to keep your AFO. <laughs> but I'm not trying to put AFOs down because they help a lot of people. They help a lot of people, especially if you grow into them slowly. And, and you know, try them out for an hour, try them out for two hours, gradually make, uh, get used to them. It's like trying on glasses for the first time. At any rate, so they're not cheap. No, you're right. So, um, so what do we do when an AFO is, an, a, is, a, is a good idea, but there's too much spasticity to really tolerate an AFO? In that circumstance, we have to treat the spasticity first to reduce the spasticity. So that there's the, so for example, with baclofen or with Botox in the ankle, in the calves, to make the legs more relaxed so that the brace can be used. So in other words, we have to address the spasticity so that we can use an AFO. And this is not uncommon. So, so AFOs uh, can be used straight out of the box, great. Sometimes we have to um, make make the situation prepared for an AFO by making the muscles relax. So I, I didn't answer the question of which type of AFO, but um, and you just start with a general, usually we start with a general AFO. Um, and, and a hinged AFO allows more movement at the ankle. Uh, I usually don't start with a hinged AFO. Um, I usually start with uh, just a regular AFO, although in children often we start with the hinged AFO, so it can be quite variable. This is the decision um, to decide between a, a, an AFO with a hinge that lets there be more movement. Um, a hinge lets it, the, 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 the toes come up, meaning that you can bend your, you can, um, bend your uh, ankle, and a, not, and a rigid, there's no hinge, but this decision is really by a, a physical medicine specialist or, or a physical therapist. Does HSP skip generations? One sibling doesn't have it, but might his or her kids have it? Sibling doesn't have it. A sibling doesn't have it. You have a sister or brother that has it. You don't. What about your children? Okay, My got it. Thank you. Well, so uh, sometimes yes, usually no. Sometimes yes, usually no. Now, it, it, uh, so this specific question is very complicated 
it, I mean, if I can make anything complicated. But here you talked about a brother, for example, having it. Let's say a brother has it, the sister does not. Let's say that neither of the parents had it, but a brother has it, male has it, and female does not. And the, the question is, what's the risk that the female can transmit it to the children if she's not affected, but her brother has it? And I'm emphasizing brother. So, if this were an X-linked form of HSP, an X-linked form, due to the gene mutation being on the X chromosome, it would affect the male, but typically not the female. And so, uh, the female could be a carrier, but, and if the female were a carrier for an X-linked condition, I know this is very complicated, but if the female were a carrier for an X-linked condition, she would ex be expected to not be affected, but could be at risk of transmitting it to her sons. Okay, that's one answer. Now, so the point is, if a sibling is affected and the other sibling is not, does there, is there a risk that the unaffected sibling could transmit it? And the, the answer is, yes, there's a risk depending on the genetic type. And, and so genetic testing might help give information in that circumstance. For example, uh, when the, when the, in this case, the male's affected and the sister's not affected, brother's, uh, brother's affected and the sister's not affected, um, what if the sister is not yet affected or only minimally affected, but is actually a gene carrier? So there's all kinds of provisos, and so, and so I can't answer, that's a, it's, a, it's a big question, but the point is, is that to really know that person's risk of transmitting the condition, gene testing could be helpful. Now, if the gene testing comes back, so we'd start in that circumstance, and I'm expanding from this question, we'd start in that circumstance to test the brother, the affected person, to see if in that family, um, the, uh, I can put this here, I guess. Well, maybe not. Um, we, we, we would start by testing the brother in that family, somebody we know has the condition, to see if gene testing can identify the condition in that family. And if, if, uh, if gene testing can identify the condition in that family, let's say it's SPG4, or let's say it's SPG7, then we'd say, well, now we know gene testing can be used in this family. Let's test, an, let's test the sibling. But what if gene testing in the brother didn't show anything? Not uncommon. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of advances in gene testing, but um, I'd say probably 30% or so, 35% is an estimate of people in whom we suspect HSP, we don't find the gene. No matter what testing we do. And it, you know, it's still gonna cost a lot of money, but the te they don't give you a discount if they don't find anything. But, uh, but uh, the gene testing, uh, if the gene testing came back negative or not definite for the brother, then we couldn't use gene testing to see if the sister were a carrier. But the, the short answer to your question is that gene testing in that family would, would say if gene testing would, might be helpful, if the gene were identified in the family, then we could use that information to see if the sister were a carrier. And if the sister's a carrier, we, we would learn that the, uh, we'd also learn the type of HSP, if it's dominant or recessive or X-linked, and we'd know that the sister's risk of transmitting it. Thank you very much. I'm ready. My, my son can't take many meds. Is this because he has HSP? Because of trouble swallowing? Uh, Who asked this question? Uh, ask me.
and he straightened out like a board, uh, many of the medications they prescribe, yeah. you just can't take them. Well, um, so, so medication, any medication tolerance, or many, many to intolerance to many medications. Yeah, not related, not as I know to HSP. However, so I don't think it's related to HSP as, as I know it and I, at this minute. However, uh, you wonder, and I'm speculating, this is just speculation, if there's some, many, med, many medications are metabolized in similar manner. And so, for example, some are not metabolized or just excreted in the urine. But um, many medications are uh, broken down in the liver. And many medications that are broken down in the liver, and I'm, I'm just speculating here, but many medications that are broken down in the liver are broken down by certain common enzymes in the liver. And I'm just wondering if the medications that are not tolerated are all metabolized by the liver in that same manner. And so there may be a, there may be a liver biochemical reason why, um, why they're not metabolized. And so if that's the case, and this, as I say, I'm speculating, but um, if that's the case, then, uh, then, then um, you, you might see if uh, that, might, that might help drug selection. You might say, well, we, if that's the common fe feature of the drugs that aren't tolerated, are there other drugs that are metabolized differently? There might not be. There might not be. Or you might have to use very, very low doses. Very, very low doses. Sure, and uh, I've, I've experienced, I have a couple patients who have said this to me, actually uh, not with HSP, with other conditions. And uh, like for example, we prescribe uh, gabapentin, typically 300, 600, 1200, 2400, up to 3600 milligrams a day. And I've had individuals say, I can take no more than 50. I, and so, you think, well, that's unusual, but every person's an individual. So for whatever reason, some people are very medication intolerant. I, I haven't ever explored why they can't, but just the approach that we use is to just take a micro amount. Yes, ma'am. Good, good, good. What they find out? Well, there are certain drugs he can't take, oh, and good. because it it identifies those enzymes and it lists the things he can take, so it's a test that you can have done. The pharmacogenetics. Yeah, I didn't mention that. Good. Thank you for thank you very much. Um, so, yes, you have a question. My testing revealed that I have both SPG7 only from my mother. Um, and it showed that I have SPG8 um, um, VUS from my father. Um, is it possible to be affected by both mutations? And um, and how would that how would that work? Because mine is complex, is both upper and lower. And from what I understand, eight is is lower only. So how could those um, can both of those affect and, and how? Uh, so hold that thought for just a minute because I want to respond to this previous one question. No, 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 just don't, don't go away. Um, so th the word you used was pharmacogenetics. And pharmaco, meaning drugs, genetics, there's testing that can be done. Often we do this, or sometimes we do it for psychiatric drugs that a person can say, um, test my DNA, and because they will, there are, there's a panel of genes that can, they can say, uh, well, based on your gene variants for this panel, the following drugs may be helpful to treat this psychiatric condition, or the following drugs 
should be have their dosage adjusted for this psychiatric condition. And what you're bringing up is uh, there's other pharmacogenetic panels that can be done that look at other drug sensitivities for how drugs are metabolized. And so that's a possibility too, to, to see uh, which medications, you can screen sometimes by DNA testing to see which, which drugs are sensitive or not. Now you ask, uh, so I just wanna finish that, but the question you ask about two genes are identified in the same person and two genes for HSP, the two HSP genes are identified. Does the person have two causes? Are each of these genes additive or interactive in some manner? Well, uh, so in theory, a person could have two causes at the same time. So a person could be, uh, in theory, a person could have two pathologic mutations. <clears throat> and they may not be interactive. So a person could have mutation in SPGX and a, a mutation in, XPG, in SPGY, and these two proteins from these genes do not interact. They're, they have their separate toxicities or deficiencies in the nerves, and, um, and the person is actually experiencing two simultaneous disorders. It'd be like having, um, you know, uh, uh, lung cancer and, uh, and uh, viral pneumonia at the same time. They both affect your lungs, but they're not caused by the same thing and they're not actually interacting. So, um, that's one. Or they could be in theory, and that's just a theory. Another theory is that they, the, 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 the first protein from the one gene and the second protein from the second gene actually interact in the same pathway, in the same biochemical pathway. And uh, that's a theory. However, there's no evidence yet that that's happened in HSP, of either of those have, having happened in HSP yet. And uh, it's always a possibility, but it hasn't hap we haven't found evidence of that yet, that there could be two genes simultaneously. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're very interested in that possibility. How, so, but you mentioned that one gene has a variant of uncertain significance. Right, and that's from my father, but right. he does not have any symptoms, and nobody, his side of the family, had any kind of symptoms that, okay. that he knows or remembers. So, with the understanding that I'm not giving specific medical advice or conclusions, I wonder if I should just have a sign that says that. <laughs> but um, if I found a, a, a variant of uncertain significance in, a, in an individual who had symptoms, and if I found that their parent who had no symptoms and had a normal neurologic exam had the same variant of uncertain significance, I would doubt the significance of that variant. So if a father, I'm just speaking in general, if a father had a, a gene variation of uncertain significance and that per person was perfectly normal, let's say that person had a SPG99 gene variation and it came back, never been seen before, but we don't know if it's pathogenic or benign, and that person had a normal exam and no symptoms, I'd say that gene variation is probably not of not meaningful. It's probably just a benign variation. We all have m thousands, m millions of gene vari or yeah, probably millions of gene variations, or thousands, hundreds of thousands of gene variations. Um, th that, you know, a gene variation is this, for example. Um, I'm, I'm going deep on this. In the United States, we spell the word color, C-O-L-O-R. But in England, they spell the word color, C-O-L-O-U-R. And so, if you're reading a, 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 a manuscript or book or something, and it says color, C-O-L-O-U-R, well, you know what it means. It means color. And they're not wrong. And we're not right. It has the same meaning. 
One is a variation of the other. And there are lots of variations in spelling. And so it doesn't change the meaning. It does show the ancestry of that. You could track it down where it came from. But it doesn't change the meaning or the use or the function of the word color. So imagine the spelling of a gene. There may be lots of ways to change the spelling of a gene that don't change the function of that protein. And so those are what we call benign or of no consequence, no biochemical consequence and no medical consequence. And so a variant of, a, but it could be the first time anybody's, the laboratory's ever seen it. It could be just a, a new spelling of a gene in a way that they say, um, you know, there's a, a lot of ways to misspell this gene, and we haven't seen this misspelling before. We can't tell you if this is just a benign misspelling, like the two ways of spelling color, or if it has significance. We can't tell you. It's the first time we ever saw it. It's not predicted to change anything, but we can't say. They, they would then write the words, variant of uncertain significance. So, if I saw that, I would say, probably of no consequence. And then, in your circumstance, you'd say, well, I have this SPG7 gene. And that, I, and if, if that gene, now, if that gene itself, they said, of uncertain significance, then I would be in a quandary. But if they said, this is a likely pathogenic mutation in that gene, and you're nodding your head. So if that's the case, I would say, that's probably the cause. And then, and if you go further, and I'm, I know this is getting personal, but if you say, uh, I have upper and lower and all kinds of symptoms, SPG7 can do that. And uh, the SPG8 does not do that. That's all I can tell you. Thank you. Dr. Fink, I'm going to read two, but I think these are closely related. Uh, what causes HSP symptom onset at such different ages, and what sets off that, quote, alarm? And then how do you define when the disease begins? This person had uh, significant reflex problems when they were younger, and their daughter thinks they just weren't maybe not diagnosed or caught until she was maybe in her 40s. Who asked this? Can I... Or maybe, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe you want to mean or not. Okay, maybe you want to mean anonymous, so let's just do it like that. Um, so, what, what causes symptoms to begin? And when does the, when does the condition begin? And, what, and what causes the, what causes, when does the condition begin? And when do symptoms begin? And uh, so, the short answer, there's a lot of I don't knows in response to this question. But what causes, when does the symptom, be, when does the condition begin, and when do symptoms begin? Well, we don't know. However, um, definitely in these conditions, the, uh, the condition begins a long time before the symptoms begin. So there's a pre-symptomatic period, the condition is, begins at some period. That could be in, in the embryo stage, or it could be in early childhood, or it could be in adolescence. We don't, it varies in different, different types, but the condition begins at some point, from embryo to uh, post-embryonic life to uh, every, every age. The condition begins, and later, the symptoms begin. Now, it's a general rule in the, in the body and in medicine that um, there's a lot of reserve capacity. So for example, a person is not gonna have liver failure until approximately 90%, and I'm not a internal medicine doctor, and so if that number is actually 70%, whatever, or kidney failure, you can lose a kidney that's 50% reduction, and have a normal life. So there's a lot of redundancy in the kidney function, in the liver function, and in the nervous system. And so we're not going to have neurologic symptoms until we exceed that reserve capacity. So if we're looking at 
upper motor neuron processes coming down the spinal cord, and they don't have a, enough at the, at the ends of those processes, and symptoms develop. Well, symptoms are only going to develop when, I don't know if the number is 90% are impaired or 70% is impaired, but a large number are impaired. So, when we exceed that threshold of reserve capacity, then symptoms begin. So, and, it, and it's a very slow process. So we don't know when it begins. It's going on its own time frame. And when that process exceeds that threshold of reserve capacity, then symptoms begin. So, it, it, and that I can tell you um, based on our understanding of other conditions. Now, when does it begin in HSP? Well, there are 90 different types of HSP and everything's gonna be individualized for different types. However, um, in general, we, th we think it begins very, very early for many types of HSP, for many types of HSP. Um, and uh, so, that is, uh, the person could be asymptomatic during this time because you see, uh, during the pre-symptomatic period, the condition's already beginning, but there are no symptoms because the condition has not yet exceeded the threshold, crossed the limit, and now um, there's no more, now that neurologic symptoms are gonna appear. I'll give you an example. Um, I saw, an, I, I did, was doing genetic studies in Arkansas and uh, in 1992, and, uh, and there are people here from Arkansas, and uh, they got some great food in Arkansas. <laughs> but at uh, uh, any rate, I'm not going in there. But uh, so uh, I saw this family, and um, big family, and uh, videotaped everybody and drew blood for genetic studies. And one person that I examined, he was uh, 17, and his father had the condition. And his uh, uncles and so forth had the condition, his grandfather had the condition, his grandmother, I don't remember. But many generations in his family had the condition, but he had no symptoms. And he was 17, and I videotaped him, and his walking was perfect. And I mean normal. And I've watched this videotape many times and shown it to many physicians. His walking was completely normal. And, uh, but we couldn't, we couldn't use him for genetic testing because he was too young. You know, the condition began in the 20s, and he was only 17, and so we couldn't make any comments. And uh, my examination of him showed that his reflexes were brisk. We score reflexes on a, uh, they weren't the maximally brisk, but they were brisk. And so I couldn't say anything about him, whether he was affected or not, whether he had the gene, because he was too young, and he was completely asymptomatic with an entirely normal walking, but his reflexes were brisk. And then I went back to the family, I think five or seven years later, and revisited him, and he was using a wheelchair. In his, in his 20s, in 25, I think. And so the condition had begun, his symptoms had begun. But I think it was, it was not a coincidence that he had a, a increased reflexes seven years before then, during his pre-symptomatic period. And so that is, that is not an uncommon scenario. Now, a person coming into a neurologist's office worried that they might have a, a genetic condition, every single person is gonna have increased reflexes from fear, anxiety. And so, you know, uh, you can't make anything of that. You would have to see them more often, and so increased reflexes by themselves is too subtle, you know? And you gotta be very careful not to overinterpret. Well, you don't have to be careful. You just don't overinterpret that. Recognizing it could be anxiety, it could be caffeine. So, uh, the point is, is that uh, 
there is a pre-symptomatic period. Now, but I, so there's, and I, I'm trying to stitch this all together in a coherent manner, and that's maybe difficult, but I'm influenced by one article I read. This is from, I think, 1976. So a long time ago, before the genetic era of HSP gene discovery and so forth. And this, this uh, article was by a radiologist, and they did x-rays of the spinal column, not CT scans, or maybe it was CT. Um, but they did x-rays of the, uh, definitely not MRI, because MRI hadn't been invented. Uh, they did x-rays of the spinal column in individuals that had what they called familial spastic paraplegia. We now use the term hereditary spastic paraplegia. And that's a subtle difference because not everything that occurs in a family is genetic. You know, COVID can affect an entire family. COVID is an infection, it's not a genetic, so forth and so on. So the term was changed from familial spastic paraplegia to hereditary spastic paraplegia. It emphasized that it's actually a genetic condition, not just a familial aggregation of the subject. In this study of 1976, looking at x-rays of the spinal column, they said that there was evidence that the spinal column, that the, air, the uh, canal where the spinal cord went through was smaller. And this is deep neuroscience I'm getting at here, so just bear, hang in there. But if the spinal, the spine, where the spinal cord, the passage where the spinal cord goes through, we call that the central canal. And they said it was, the central canal was smaller in people that had familial spastic paraplegia. Well, in embryology, this is really a fundamental point in embryology, the nervous system induces the overlying tissues to develop. So the spinal cord, in an embryology period, induces the overlying mesoderm that's, been, that's gonna become the bone and the muscles to develop. There's a neurologic induction of the overlying tissues. And so what that suggested to me from 1976 article was that there was some in, uh, lack of induction of the overlying, because this, this is a process, the spinal canal, that's not developing in, in adulthood. That's something that's fixed from early embryonic period and early infancy and so forth. It's not changing. Um, the, the canal size is not changing. We're not talking about the cord being compressed or any structural consequences, nothing like that. We're just talking about the size of that canal. And they found evidence, and I, was very, I found this to be very interesting, um, that uh, it, was, it suggested to me that there was some, this is what it suggested to me, uh, was that there was some insufficient induction of the overlying tissues to develop into their normal shape. And that induction would come from the spinal cord. Now, I'm just sharing my thoughts on this. So, if you then look at, um, uh, if you then look at uh, some forms of, of uh, well, some individuals with Huntington's chorea. Huntington's chorea, separate genetic disorder. And you say, well, Huntington's chorea begins, let's say, for example, at age 40, or age 35, or age 48, or whatever it does. But some MRI scans in children who have no symptoms of Huntington's but have the Huntington's gene mutation show um, smaller regions of the brain that are later going to be affected by Huntington's. So that we see, even in their pre-symptomatic period, these are children asymptomatic, entirely asymptomatic for Huntington's, but they have the Huntington's gene mutation, we see on imaging that, that, that those parts of the brain that are affected by the Huntington's gene mutation are a little smaller or different in, in some ways. And so we say, actually, that must have happened early in their development, even though much later the symptoms began. So the point I'm trying to get at is, when, does, and when, does this, when do the symptoms begin? I think they begin probably, not the, con the symptoms. When does the condition begin? I think, 
for many types, not all types, I think for many types, the condition begins very early, probably in utero. That's what, that's what I think, but I wouldn't say it's a generalization for all types. And then, um, what, what governs the onset of symptoms? How long is that pre-symptomatic period? And can we delay the onset? Let's say that a person has a pre-symptomatic period. Let's say, you know, we're going to not, we're not going to fix the condition, but we're just going to delay the onset until you're 110 years old. Okay? That's okay. Um, so, we're just going to delay that onset. So, we don't really, we don't know yet what, what um, affects the onset. Is it the rate of progression? Is it... We just need to slow down the progression. That's one thing. I'm not sure. Um, are there other factors that trigger the problem? It's another possibility that, you know, you have a tendency for a disorder and then some other um, process induces it to um, become more um, deleterious. I can't answer that. Is it... Uh, but, um, so... The short answer is, we think, it, for many types, I think it begins very early, and I, that's based on uh, a number of uh, disparate studies and generalizations, and, uh, and progresses very, very slowly until a threshold of, of uh, injury has occurred, and then symptoms begin. And <clears throat> I haven't, I haven't, uh, there have been a few people I've met that have very rapid onset of HSP. That is, over six months. However, 99.9% .9 of people with HSP have very, very slow onset. And, uh, the, and, so, and that very slow onset is a part, is very helpful in making the diagnosis of HSP. The very slow onset is helpful in making the diagnosis of HSP. So for example, if someone comes into the clinic and says, I have trouble walking. I say, when did it begin? They said, on uh, last Labor Day, I was at a picnic, and before then I was fine, but the day after Labor Day, I, my legs felt heavy, and two days later I could hardly walk. That's not HSP. And if, 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 or if somebody says, well, I, I know uh, it was between my, this birthday and that birthday, it was in the springtime. I can't tell what day, but it was in the spring. If a person can date the onset, of symptoms to a day or a season or even a year, it's probably not HSP. The typical symptoms, the typical history of the slow onset in HSP is this. Um, a, a, man, a, a, a man will come into the clinic and say, well, I, I think I've got HSP. I mean, my, I have trouble walking, and my symptoms began uh, when I was uh, about 35. And then the, the, the wife will say, that's not true because I remember when, you, when we went on this vacation in, in, to such and such and you had those, that trouble walking up those stairs and you were, or I saw you uh, at so-and-so's wedding and your feet were going in this way. I could see it for many years. And then the husband will say, I didn't have any symptoms then. And, the, and that's not denial. It's that it's, it's a it begins so subtly and the body compensates and the walking pattern changes so gradually that a person grows into that walking style and it's evident to other people, but the person themselves is not encumbered or limited by it for a long, for a period of time. And that, that, that business about the person said they've had it for five years and the spouse says no, it was more like ten, that is almost to a person. Uh, so. That, that we're talking about a very gradual onset, so gradual that there, and this is my opinion, that there's compensation in the walking style, so walking continues unaffected. Uh, functionally, walking continues, uh, you know, the person has adapted. Their neuroplasticity has occurred. Their, their own rehabilitation, functional rehabilitation is ongoing, and they're, they're adapting to this process for years until it becomes um, uh, manifest. Now, the last thing I'll say on this, and I, I'll stop, is uh, this question is that for some forms of HSP, it is not 
It does not appear to be um, degenerative. It appears only to be developmental from birth. And um, the first time I saw this was in Turkey. And uh, it was a, like a light went off. I, was, I can remember it to this day. I was in the back. I saw this big family in Turkey. And we were in a taxi cab. And I was going over it. And I said, well, this, this is very unusual. I've seen many families with HSP before that. But I said, this is very unusual because everybody in this family looks like they've got cerebral palsy. And uh, I mean, it was, they, they're born, they're healthy, and as soon as they start walking, they're walking on their toes, and then 20 years later, they're still walking on their toes. But they're not going from toe walking to wheelchairs. Whatever they have, they have. It's just, that's it. Um, the degree of involvement. And so, uh, so there are, and then, We've seen that pattern in many types, many different genetic types of, chi of early childhood onset. So when it's a non-progressive pattern, the, um, the general thought in neurology that is symptoms that begin and, and are not getting worse, we say those, that's a, the way the brain or the spinal cord or both was formed. And so that's a developmental problem that began early in development and is not a progressive problem. Okay, that's all I can say. This person has children that are 19 and 25, and the question is, should my children be tested? And this person has concerns for how that might mentally, psychologically affect so one the of these. First, read the first part of the question again. Uh, this person has children that are 19 so, and 25. Mm -hmm. Should they be genetically tested? This person fears how that child might react if they learn they have it, and they haven't had those symptoms yet. And the parents affected? Yes. Okay. Well, should children be, should asymptomatic children be tested? Well, so uh, the uh, American uh, Society of Genetic Counseling recommends against testing um, minor subjects for genetic disorders that are not treatable. And so that's a generalization. And uh, um, it would, for many reasons, besides the, that we're talking about testing minor subjects who are not symptomatic, asymptomatic, testing asymptomatic children for disorders that are not treatable. Certainly if, if there was a treatment, we'd want to identify that early and they say, you have no symptoms, but if you did, there's treatment, so we need to identify. That's different. But if there's no treatment, um, they advise against testing unaffected minor subjects. Now, several reasons for that. First, what are you, what are you gonna do with the information if you find a gene that's, if you find a gene mutation? Does that mean that the child will develop the condition? 100%, well, no, not necessarily 100%. And when would they develop any symptoms? Would it be early? Would it be late? Would they be mild? Would they be moderate? Would they be severe? So would symptoms begin um, three years later or 40 years later? Would, they, would the symptoms be disabling or not disabling? What are you gonna tell that person? You wouldn't know based on that gene testing. You might make a prediction based on group averages for the average age of onset of this gene mutation. But that group averages, uh, that's not that helpful when you're trying to tell the person in front of you what's gonna happen. You say, well, on average, it could be. Well, what does that mean? You say, I really don't know for you as an individual when the symptoms would begin or how severe the symptoms would be or even if there'd be any symptoms at all. So. Anyways, we're not going to test, I'm not going to, we're not going to test, rec, we're, we're going to recommend against testing minor subjects. Besides the fact that the person themselves that would be stigmatized, they would think uh, every time they would stumble, they will hear its beginning and, and it'd be a, it would affect all kinds of um, self, uh, uh, you know, body image and self-esteem and, and interactions. It would be a lot of, a lot of problems with no merit. Uh, so. Now, in this question, the children are 19 and 25. I mean, they're adults. And adults can do what they want. 
adults can elect to be tested for conditions to know their risk of developing those conditions. That's up to that person. That's what we call pre-symptomatic testing of a, of a person at risk. And an adult can elect to do that. And so in this circumstance, those individuals could decide that they want to know. And they may say, it could, it may be, uh, they may not want to know, uh, but then they say, oh, now we're considering uh, children, and, and it may be relevant in that circumstance for them to know, and they, and they as adults could decide for testing. So I'm separating the question out. Could the, does, should the parent recommend testing? I would say I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use that approach that the parent of adult children would recommend testing. Uh, but you know, you could say, but, but you could have discussions like, if you want to know, or if at some point in your life you feel like it would be useful to you, um, either you're having symptoms that make you concerned, or you're considering children, then that they as adults could make that decision. We've got about 40 minutes left, and I'm not going to get through all the questions that I have, and I know some folks have already had to leave. So uh, we're gonna do this, we're gonna put Tim on the run. If you, uh, if you asked a question that on the board and we haven't gotten to that, raise your hand. Or if you have a question uh, that you didn't put on the board, we're going to ask you to uh, ask Dr. Think those questions and we'll go in that direction. I had one earlier. We'll get back to you. I'm coming over here. We're going to kind of work the room. We got two mics. Here we go. Dr. Fink, I'm SPG4. Um, does stress progress HSP? Uh, uh, I don't think it makes the condition progress faster. I think it makes the symptoms worse. Uh, I don't think it, it advances the rate of the condition. It absolutely makes spasticity worse. It absolutely interferes with sleep all kinds of consequences of stress. But I don't think it makes the condition, I think the condition is just on its own time frame. Dr. Fink, I'm, I'm sorry, were you finished? No, you're, you're fine, it's your turn. Uh, in Atlanta, you said something that was profound to me. Uh, you said that the symptoms plateau at some point, but unfortunately we didn't know where we, we were still coming up or if we were on that plateau. Do you still believe, uh, think that? Well, the word plateau means flat. And um, so the, the short answer is, oh, I'm gonna, yes, I still, I still um, think that's true for many, but not, not all subjects, both with PLS and HSP. However, I wanna focus on that word plateau. Plateau means flat. And, and so if we say, well, the degree of walking impairment has reached a plateau, meaning it's not changing. Well, that's not true because age affects everyone. Age affects your ability to, to how fast you walk, your stride length, your balance, all, every neurologic function and all, every other uh, you know, systemic function is affected by age. And so, uh, and uh, so age is having its impact on walking in every person besides HSP. So everybody's ability to walk and run, even if we take out HSP, is changing because of age. So there is no real plateau. Even in, 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 in I mean, a person has HSP and let's say their spouse doesn't have HSP, that spouse who doesn't have HSP, their walking is declining over time. And let's say two spouses, same diet, same lifestyle, let's say the same genetic background, which is impossible, but <laughs> uh, similar, uh, well, may be declining at a similar rate. It may be parallel. The rate of their decline may be parallel. So there is no plateau. What, we mean by pl what I mean by plateau is that the rate of decline is similar to the rate of decline from age. So if there's a, a rate, and I'm going to use this board here. 
Come back. If we say that this is, you know, infancy, child doesn't, this is the ability to walk, 100%. And at birth, the child can't walk. And then, at, let's say by a year or so, they're taking steps, nine months, 10, 12, 15 months. So right at birth, there's zero ability to walk, but then they quickly increase and they stay good but and for many years it's good and then starts to decline and I don't want to make, make zero let's say this is uh, you know 110 it's pretty optimistic but actually so there is an age-related decline in walking. And, but what do you mean by walking? We mean the speed of walking, the number of steps per day, the, the stride length, the balance. Walking has many components. Um, now, this is not actually accurate because there is no line. There's a zone. It's a zone, normal is not a line, normal is a, a, is a range. And some people are, you know, better walkers and faster runners and more agile, and other people are less. This is normal. Now, this, what I'm saying is a generalization. Let's say at some point in this range, a person starts to have symptoms of trouble walking. I don't, I'm just, at whatever age. So they're in the normal zone for a period of time, and then their walking starts to fall off the normal zone. Okay? So that they are experiencing a decline in their walking that is not parallel to the age decline. They're experiencing a decline in their walking that's more rapid. The rate of decline of this line, let's make it more like this. The rate of this decline is faster than the age-related rate. And so what I mean by, and this is my observation, and I've made it in, and, 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 and similar people, similar observations have been made in primary lateral sclerosis. And this is not for every person. But for many people, not everyone, after a period of time, this rate seems to slow down and seems to be relatively parallel to the rate of decline. And I haven't made numbers. This is just anecdotal observation. But after a period of time, this first rate of decline at a, at a fast rate seems to be re, um, slowing down. And it seems that, and I would speculate that this rate of decline is parallel to the age-related decline. And so plateau means flat, you know, a flatness. Uh, well, that's looking up, but uh, I'm trying to say a flatness here. Um, it's not a flat, it's not a plateau, meaning no change, but that the rate of change, so I've used the word plateau, but I, I want to, I don't, that's not accurate. It's really a, what I mean by that is that the, it, it seems to evolve into a slower rate of decline that's parallel to the rate of decline from age with one proviso. This is very important proviso. And that is, okay, you want this back? Okay, good. So, and it, it is this. If a person is not, if a person's average walking, and this is a theory, but if a person is on average taking 50% fewer steps than normal, then they're, they may have, let's say a person is on a couch 80% of the time their rate of decline in their walking is going to be at a faster rate from deconditioning. So what if a person has trouble walking and the condition makes them walk less, then they may have a faster rate of decline just because of inactivity. So anyway, there's a lot of nuance in, in, in this, but point is, 
You're, you asked, do I think that after a period of time, the rate of decline seems to slow down for many people with HSP and with PLS? And the answer is yes. I do. Not for everybody. Some people, it just keeps getting worse year after year after year, even in adulthood. But n most people uh, don't seem to, they seem to slow down. Now, one separate comment on that is that spasticity never sleeps. Spasticity if, just gets worse and worse and worse. And so the condition might slow down, but spasticity may advance. And this is a, um, so, so we always need to keep spasticity in abatement as much as we can with stretching and medication and all the physical therapies and so forth. So we need to keep spasticity. So even at a, let's say a child has cerebral palsy, and let's say that's a non-progressive condition, cerebral palsy, it doesn't get worse. If they don't treat spasticity, then the tendons are gonna get shorter, they'll be contractures. Even though the condition is not changing, the person has a stroke. The day they have a stroke, the stroke happens over two minutes and their arm is paralyzed at their side. Within two minutes, three minutes, their arm is just hanging at their side. And they go to the emergency room and the arm is floppy. It's, it's a hypotonic. No spasticity. But over two months, three months, six months, the arm is drawn up into a spastic position. Now the stroke is not ongoing. The stroke happened. The stroke is over. That process is completed in minutes. But over time, there's increasing, increasing, increasing spasticity of the wrist, the hand, the elbow, the shoulder. It's all gonna get tighter and tighter on this side or whatever part of the body is affected by that. So spasticity can advance. Same thing after a spinal cord injury. Person comes in with spinal cord injury, uh, emergency room, their legs are just floppy. And over time, they get more and more and more spasticity. So spasticity comes on even though the, the problem is completed. Hey, Dr. So, Fink, uh, yeah. oops, sorry, I thought.